you folks listen now to the greatest of our Grand Ole Opry stars, the Texas troubadour, Ernest Tubb. Of all the genres and styles of music in the classic canon, none has deviated so far from its initial social function as country music. What started as a way to adapt a traditional folk narrative to be preserved within a modern, industrialised, commoditized world has now evolved into an almost unidentifiable and possibly unholy amalgam of click tracks, auto-tuning and songs about new trucks, winding back roads in places a singer has almost certainly never been to, and long tanned legs framed by Daisy Dukes propped up on the dashboard. I'm not here to say that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but when people mention the golden eras of country music, well, they tend not to talk about the tan legs on the dashboard years. They tend to talk of the years of tubercular middle-aged men who are Saturday night sinners and Sunday morning saints. The first golden age of country music began no doubt in 1927 with Ralph Peer's legendary Bristol sessions held in an old hat factory on the Tennessee side of that border straddling town which gave us, amongst others, the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers. It was Rogers' recording of Tea for Texas in 1928 that opened the floodgates for country music. There had been big hits before, but they were catalogue songs, ones that accumulated sales over long periods. Rogers was a sensation. He was being pulled all over the country on the basis of one record, and he followed it up with hit after hit. His success? allied to the boom in radio shows like WLS's Barn Dance out of Chicago or WBAP from Fort Worth with their own Barn Dance show, or the new kid on the block, WSM's Grand Ole Opry out of Nashville, started a craze and a talent rush for what was then known as hillbilly music. The term was first used by Uncle Dave Macon on his 1924 record Hillbilly Blues, similar to that kicked off by Mamie and Bessie Smith in the blues. The first golden age was characterized by a strong relationship between the music and its traditional folk sources, largely by adapting or by borrowing from songs within the Scotch-Irish folk heritage as carried on in Appalachia. The themes were straightforward enough, family, piety, work and struggle, and man's fall from grace, from moral failings to murder. Lots of murder. Oddly, relatively few love songs. Also typical and characterizing was the one element of country music which has always differentiated it from the blues or R&B, the order of precedence within the song. The blues has always emphasized the voice, the arrangement, particularly expressive soloing, and then the narrative, which has always had a fundamentally mystical edge to it given its basis long ago in the fusion of African and European spiritual modes and its evolution from a coded language of field hands, along with an acceptance that the human condition was inevitable. Country music, on the other hand, has always been about the story, detailed, exact and frank narratives, and the belief that the human condition could be transcended by grace. While it's tempting to see country music as thematically dominated by the themes of family, work, sin and redemption and reward for 20, 25 years since the get-go, there was another significant strand of the music that was eventually to surpass the initial wave of country superstars and provide the bridge to the second golden age. Hill music has always had a strong tradition of dance songs, and that string band tradition, fused with its Texas counterpart, gave us a light, irreverent dance music which, when exposed to the jazz musicians and the musical hub of Oklahoma City and the increasing blues influence on the Texas fiddle bands, began to emerge as what we now call Western Swing. Several luminaries got their start in these hot fiddle bands. The king himself, Roy Acuff, uh, one of the two, and the other was Jimmy Rogers, premier stars of the initial rush of country later to become its homebound phone call as the country music audience dispersed to find work or was swallowed by urbanization in the second golden age and in the third its revered elder statesman. As the second golden era sustained and intensified around 1947, Fred Rose pushed to replace the increasingly pejorative term hillbilly music with 
country and western. We'll come back to the first golden age, the Bristol Sessions and the remarkable Bob Wills soon enough. Why do the second golden age before the first? Because reasons. We're chiefly going to focus on one artist who played a major role in bridging the foundational styles of country music with its next significant development, the honky tonk sound, and was one of the biggest stars as the music came out of the south and went nationwide the Texas troubadour himself, Mr. Ernest Tubb. Crisp, Texas is a tiny little speck about 35 miles south of Dallas and 20 miles east of Waxahachie. 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 It's got to be the, the greatest word in the English language. Waxahachie. Ernest Tubb was born thereabouts in February 1914. His dad worked a share, so Ernest spent his young life roaming from cotton farm to cotton farm, helping his family eke out a meagre existence. He passed what little spare time he had learning to play the guitar and yodel. When he was 15, he heard Jimmy Rogers for the first time and became a lifelong devotee, modeling his style slavishly on his hero. It was actually a fanboy letter to Roger's widow requesting an autograph photo, which led to a friendship and eventually a recommendation to Victor, where Tubb cut his first records very much in the Jimmy Rogers mould. Since that black cat crossed my path does, however, show Tubb's remarkable disregard for metre and bar lines, which we'll come back to later. A switch to Decca did the trick in 1940, My Baby and My Wife, a song that squarely in the family and piety wheelhouse was one of the biggest hits of 1940. Tubb was to spend the next 30 years with Decker. Along with Bob Wills, Ted Daffin and Floyd Tillman, Tubb was one of the young Turks on the charts in the early 40s, while Roy Akif, at his peak as a hitmaker and the gatekeeper between the old and the new, and Gene Autry both had significant success. In 1941, Tubb recorded the million seller Walkin' the Floor Over You, one of the most influential records ever in country music as it laid the seeds for the coming golden age of honky tonk and later development into rockabilly. Tubb enjoyed three other big hits that year in which Autry Wills and Jimmy Wakely, a run-of-the-mill cowboy singer, had big hits. Hank Penny, a western swingster who later recorded in the hot zone between country rockabilly and proto rock and roll, also had his first big hit with Won't You Ride In My Little Red Wagon. Tubb dominated the jukeboxes with six hits in 1942. Significantly, a song called I Ain't Honky Tonkin Anymore, and the wheels of change were turning. Al Dexter himself also had a smash with Meet Me Down in Honky Tonk Town. So, what were the musical elements that distinguished the nascent honky tonk sound from the previous hillbilly styles it was fast supplanting? While still Highly narrative songs, Honky Tonk was characterised by a greater emphasis on swing in the arrangement. Imagine it as a small band adaption of what larger Western swing orchestras were doing, much like small R&B combos were emerging as economic factors made big band jazz no longer viable, and a greater emphasis on the vocal quality known as sincerity, a vocal intangible roughly equivalent to what R&B might call soul. Sincerity simplifies and doesn't overstate the emotion. It is plainly and simply sung in the emotional tenor the song requires. From Roy Akif, perhaps the first singer to be known for this quality, right through to George Strait, it's almost universally been considered the greatest weapon after the song itself in the country singer's arsenal. Ernest Tubb, with his homespun, slightly flat vocal style, mastered it such that he was known as Mr. Sincerity. Honky Tonk emerged largely through the migration of rural young men from the farms to the cities and the factories and became their outlet for the sense of deracination and divorce from familiar moral and spiritual anchors in their lives. By the time the wartime and post-war diaspora was complete around 1947, Honky Tonk was the defining sound of country, harder, emotionally confronting, yet still accepting that the human condition could be transcended. Tub dug into his stockpile of hits and had a very productive 1943, but that year was dominated by one of the greatest country hits ever, with Al Dexter's Pistol Pack and Mama. Now, a word on this, in the early days of chart making, if, say, five people made a version of the same record, as they did with Pistol Pack and Mama, the total sales of the title were counted, not how many each individual version sold, but it is widely established that despite competition from the like of Bing Crosby, Al Dexter's was the biggest selling version. 
So dominant was the record that not only was it the biggest hit of 1943, it also spent seven weeks at number one in 1944 and was one of five chart toppers that Dexter had that year. Touring anywhere and constantly, by 1943, Tubb was a member of the Grand Ole Opry. 1944 saw his biggest hit yet, Soldier's Last Letter, which spent seven months on the chart and made the pop top 20. 1944 was really the last flag year for the older, more sentimental styles of country music, encouraged no doubt by the mounting toll of the war. In 1945, Tubb hit number one again with It's Been So Long, Darling. 1946 was a quieter year with his classic honky tonk in all but name version of Driving Nails in My Coffin, his major hit as well as Filipino Baby. In a year again dominated by Al Dexter, Bob Wills and the first major honky tonk hit, Divorce Me COD by the great Merle Travis, the first country song ever to mention the D-I-V-O-R-C-E word. Still, with nine weeks at number one, the next golden age of country music had arrived. Tubb was back on top in 1947 with the frankly mawkish Rainbow at Midnight, Merle Travis and Tex Williams both had three month plus number ones, and Eddie Arnold began his unprecedented run of chart dominance. From November 1947 to the last week of 1948, Arnold spent 56 out of 59 weeks at number one, with five different songs. 1949 saw Tubb take his version of the Honky Tonk Classic slipping around to the top, one of the earliest explicit cheating songs, and courtesy of a record-breaking four months atop the chart with Lovesick Blues, young up-and-comer Hank Williams started to formally write down the defining rules of Honky Tonk, the keening vocal style, the twin interplay between the fiddle and the steel guitar, and the plain-spoken tale of loss, heartbreak, and or thwarted desire. So, in the tumultuous 10 years between the era dominated by acoustic western swing, cowboy ballads and the superstars of the Grand Ole Opry, and the arrival of the electric, deeply personal honky-tonk style, Tubb, one of the change's great progenitors, had enjoyed six number one hits, 20 top tens, plus another couple with the Andrew sisters and his good friend Red Foley, and crossed over into the pop top 30 eight times. A respectable return, not quite Eddie Arnold, who did actually fade very quickly after his Annis Mirabilis, or Bob Will's numbers, but what it did inspire was a legendarily loyal group of fans who sold out venues up to 290 nights a year, right up to his retirement in 1982. Ernest Tubb pushed himself to the forefront of country music by the end of World War II. By dint of a remarkable voice, it's Pretty fair to say no one before or since has ever sung like Ernest Tubb. Crack bands to rival the core of Bob Wills's, counting the great, great Jerry Bird on steel guitar. He was inducted into the Steel Guitar Hall of Fame as member number one. Genius guitarist Billy Bird, no relation to Jimmy. Jimmy Short, steel guitarist Buddy Emmons, the ninth man into the Hall of Fame, and Buddy Charlton, the 30th man into the Hall of Fame, I did my research, plus hot fiddler Tommy Jackson amongst many others, and a good deal of wry, folksy humour in his lyric, even when the songs were sad. Conventional wisdom has it that the overt emotionalism of gospel music may have been some kind of reference point for the newly evolving youth-oriented musics of the 1950s. While that seems to be the official line of a history written by its apparent winners, it is to discount the emotional directness, intimacy and frankness of country music. As Mr. Sincerity, Tubb seemed to be able to make the song seem so personal and so direct to the listener that instead of the collective ecstasy of gospel, one has the feeling of almost a private communion. And in doing so, and in mixing the profound and the profane in song, Tubb understood the essential dichotomy that underpinned the post-war country music as it evolved from the rural and range music to the blue-collar music of a recovering and dispersing South, the dichotomy between Saturday night in the honks and Sunday morning in the church. He even had a song for it, one of his last great records, Saturday Satan, Sunday Saint. That sense of letting it all go tonight and letting tomorrow take care of itself and the attendant accountability for the consequences of following one's own feelings was not only the dominant emotional philosophy behind Honky Tonk, but also carried down to Honky Tonk's stepchild rockabilly and into rock and roll. 
And it was Tub with that monster hit Walking the Floor Over You who really kick-started Honky Tonk and set country music on its way to its first great commercial peak. But that was just one of his many accomplishments. He was the first artist to use an electric guitar on stage at the Grand Old Opry. He was the first country musician to perform at Carnegie Hall. He was the sixth man inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. And he was the first major country star to base himself and record in Nashville. He sang Beyond the Sunset at Hank Williams' funeral. He used to self-deprecatingly say that he was so consistently out of tune with his vocals that men would play his songs on the jukebox so they could brag to their girlfriends that they could sing better than Ernest Tubb. He also, like his idol Jimmy Rogers, never met a bar line that he got along with. What took most singers eight bars to get through, Ernest would knock out in eleven or seven or nine and a half and yet despite all of this Tubb had hits in five different decades only George Jones has had a longer span and racked up 91 chart hits and a fair few before there were charts only seven people have ever had more Conway Twitty, Dolly Parton, Reba McIntyre, Johnny Cash, Merle Haggard and the two Georges Strait and Jones. In the end Ernest Tubb had quite a career for a guy who couldn't sing. Waxahatchee, 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 waxahatchee.